the newly transcribed Enfield Poltergeist tapes. Just before Morris Gross died, he asked me to come and see him and said, would I take custodianship of the tapes of all of the Enfield material that he'd made in the 18 months that he was there? And Guy Playfair unfortunately died about just over a year ago. And he, in the terms of his will, said that he would like a similar thing to happen, that the tapes should belong to the Society for Psychical Research, but that I should look after them. I, as it says on the back of the book, do not buy this book if you want a biased account one way or the other. But if you want to know what was certainly heard on those tapes, then you should be buying the book. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance three years ago in episodes 54 55 and 56 i devoted all of our time to covering the enfield poltergeist and the then upcoming conjuring 2 film that of course in my opinion inaccurately portrays ed and lorraine warren as the main investigators of the enfield case i've discussed my feelings on this several times over the years But I think you'll find that now that hundreds of hours of investigation recordings from Morris Gross and Guy Lyon Playfair have been transcribed, my feelings have been kind of validated and more of the truth is out. If you've heard my interview with the late Guy Lyon Playfair, you'll be interested to know that the tapes validate his memory as well. But that's not the point of the book with these new transcriptions. But if you're interested, in those past episodes, visit bigseance.com slash 54 or 55 or 56. Just change the number. Dr. Melvin Willing has researched alleged paranormal phenomena for over 25 years and has two doctorates in related aspects of the subject. His own research has included the place of music in alleged cases of paranormality. The efficacy of witchcraft spells and the veracity of claims about supernatural powers within martial arts. He is the Honorary Archives Liaison Officer and a Council Member of the Society for Psychical Research and a Consultant to the Ghost Club. He has published many articles and several books on a variety of themes within psychical research. He has been the custodian of the Enfield Poltergeist tapes since the deaths of Morris Gross and Guy Lyon Playfair, and he has transcribed and digitized the complete collection. He knew both men personally and shared many hours of conversation with them about the case, and it's the book The Enfield Poltergeist Tapes, one of the most disturbing cases in history, What Really Happened, that we are going to talk about today. I'm so excited. Dr. Melvin Willing, welcome to the parlor. Thank you very much for having me. We are glad to have you, and I bet my listeners are glad to have the topic brought back up. It's been a while. So I received an email from the publisher about your book called The Enfield Poltergeist Tapes, and I immediately ordered the book and then looked up your contact information to find you. I was so excited. It's it's a lot of detail, but it's juicy in a paranerd kind of way. And in fact, I feel like those of us who have followed this story have really earned this opportunity to get a glimpse into what's in the tapes. And I'm still shocked that they haven't really transcribed it, uh, uh, transcribed the tapes until now. So I'm really glad you did that. Can you start by telling us how the opportunity to get a hold of these tapes came to you and a little about how you went about transcribing and digitizing them? And also, did you do a cartwheel when you picked up the tapes? 
<laughs> to answer your last question first, no, I did not do a cartwheel. Uh, my body wouldn't allow me to. <laughs> What happened was just before Maurice Gross died, he asked me to come and see him and said, would I take custodianship of the tapes of all of the Enfield material that he'd made in the 18 months that he was there, which I, of course, agreed to and started the transcription almost immediately. Well, then time passed on and Guy Playfair unfortunately died about just over a year ago. And he, uh, in the terms of his will, said that he would like a similar thing to happen, that the tapes should belong to the Society for Psychical Research, but that I should look after them. So I set about then transcribing and digitizing those tapes. Now, once I'd got the two lots of tapes, which was about 400 hours worth of material, once I'd, I'd transcribed them all, listened to them all, I thought, well, this should now be going out to the public so that they can make their own mind up uh, about what's actually happened at Enfield rather than the biased accounts in either one direction or the other. In other words, it's all rubbish. It was all the girls playing around or it was all 100 percent believable. The spirits were there in force. So what I attempt to do with the book is to present what can be heard on those tapes with some commentary and then let the reader decide. Do you think Guy had the idea of making them public in the whole time, or did he just think he was giving them to you just like for storage or something? I, I think he was very happy. I, I knew Guy fairly well, and I knew Morris very well, I would say. And I think they were both very happy for the tapes to be transcribed and for them to eventually be in the public domain. Yeah, I was so sorry to hear about Guy's passing. I consider myself very, very fortunate to have the opportunity to talk to him, and I will never forget that conversation. I was so nervous. I don't know why. I was so nervous before I talked to him and connected, and it was uh, one of the coolest conversations ever, and I laughed really hard, and one thing I always remember is uh, we were getting ready to start the interview, just like I was with you today. And he said, well, hang on, let me crawl in my box. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he, it, you know, long story short, he had a box that he basically, you know, just put around his head while he was doing the interview because he wanted it to sound good. And I thought that was the funniest thing to imagine. <laughs> he may have been joking. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You <sighs> fell for it. <laughs> I guess so. Actually, I think he called it his studio first. He said, well, let me just walk into my studio. And I said, do you have a studio? Um, hello. Is this Mr. Playfair? Yep. Hello. How yes. are you, sir? Oh, okay. A bit cold. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. That's interesting. Today here, this is Patrick the Keller, by the way. And just to be clear, I'm recording now, but it's not yeah. live. Let me just climb into my... Mobile studio. Okay. Uh, is that any better? Um, it, I haven't noticed yet, but I, it might sound better when I hear the recording. Well, there should be less uh, interference from oh, okay. outside. Okay, cool. There are a few sort of cats and things outside the window here, but I think no, no traffic, so, so um, it's not too bad. Oh, so it's an actual studio for you? No, it's a cardboard box. Oh. <laughs> but they're, they're extremely effective. I mean, they... they um, if, if there is a little noise, it makes a huge difference. Well, that well, I appreciate you doing that for us. Well, it's very simple. You, yeah. You just get a big cardboard box and stick it over your head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that's it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, guy for you. <laughs> well, I did want to uh, read a paragraph that you wrote in your book just to give people an idea of how hardcore this was. Um, during the course of their report, you say that Gross and Playfair claimed to have made approximately 180 visits to the house in Enfield, including 25 all-night vigils, making an equivalent of more than 1,000 hours. They also reported some 140 hours of tape recordings up to the time of writing their report in June 19. 
78. So one of the more popular elements to this case has always been the voices that came from mostly Janet, but also the other children in the home. I'm breaking in briefly here because I want to include a sample of the infamous voices that were produced in the Enfield case. It does sound scary, so if you have small paranerds listening with you, it might not be something they want to listen to right now. So skip ahead two minutes if that's the case. It does help to know what the voice actually sounded like, though. And this clip comes from YouTube and existed before these new transcriptions. Hello. Yeah, hello. Goodbye. How he did that. Now, are you going to tell me how you, how you knocked that sassy over? Come on, tell me how you knocked it over. By the bottom. You what? <laughs> you what? Pulled it by the bottom. Yes. Underneath. Underneath it, yes. yes. And what did you do? Then what did you do? Make Janet come in the room first. Why did you make? Why did you have to make Janet come in the room first? So she gets the blame. So she gets the blame. Oh. Yes. Could you do it if, if Margaret came in the room first? Might be. Or, or or if Mrs. Hodgson came in the room first, could you do it then? No, she's too old. <laughs> she's too old. <laughs> could you do it if I came in the room first? No. Well, what's age got to do with it? What, what difference does it make? How I take old? energy from young people, not old ones. Oh, you only take energy? Yes. Why can't you take energy from old people? I use it all in the day. Pardon? I use it all. Oh, old people use more energy during the day. And, and do young people store it up then? Yes. How do you take their energy? Electric shocks. You take it by electric shocks? <laughs> More. Do you take electrical energy then? Yes, I can. If you can? I can take electrical energy. You can take electrical yes. energy? Yes. If you don't take the energy, could you tip the SETI up if you didn't take the energy? No, no, I couldn't. You couldn't Impossible. do it? Impossible. Impossible? Yes. You always have to use energy from people? Yes. Can't you take energy from anything else? No. You can't? No. What else can you do with energy? Tip the chairs over, pull the plugs out. Yeah, but you can do other things, can't you? Put books through the window. <laughs> no, put books through the window. Who put the books through the window? I did. You know, what was it like listening to so much of that? And, and did you form any opinions about the voice after transcribing so much of it? Well, the voices were, of course, very dramatic, but I was less impressed with the voices than I was with some of the other material that happened there. In between the gruff voices that three of the children were making at different times, and as you said, Janet in particular, there was an awful lot of girls' laughter, and one was never quite sure whether they were putting it on a bit or whether it was a genuine voice coming through them that they couldn't control. Having said that, at times, the voices were extremely graphic, obscene, explicit, quite shocking. There was also a lot of screaming and shouting and general upset coming out from everybody there. So it was quite um, disturbing, shall we say, at times, the amount of, of chaotic activity that was going on. And you said that some of the tapes weren't even uh, listenable, correct, because they were in such bad condition? Yes, unfortunately, because of the age of some of them and not using the best of quality, some of the tapes had completely corrupted and therefore it was impossible to actually digitize them, even getting specialist people to try and unravel and scrape off the residue of things that were on them. One other point I must mention is that both Gartner Morris and Guy had a nasty habit of using old tapes. So you would start off with a bit of a Beethoven symphony, and then you'd have the voices coming in. <laughs> then you'd have the remainder of the Beethoven symphony and another bit of voice. And at times I was tearing my few remaining hairs out. <laughs> I bet it really did just drive you nuts, especially when you found a tape that you couldn't really get into. But it sounds like they uh, organized their tapes and use their tapes about like I did when I was a child in the <laughs> early 80s. <laughs> yes, organizing is not a word I would apply to them. 
<laughs> yeah, you said it was very difficult to determine sometimes the date and who was present and, you know, the different situations going on. So hats off to you for putting that effort in there. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I mean, there was a load of problems with the tapes. I'm just looking here. I've, I've got a list, if you like, of, of the problems of looking at tapes. Um, was it broken and was it repairable? Did the tape play or did the speed change? Was the content audible? Did it begin at side A or side B or halfway through? Was the taping process flawed? Was the label on the cassette holder the same as what was on the tape? And what was on the tape? Because a lot of the time the people weren't identified, so one had to try and work out exactly who was who. And as I've already said, some of the tapes had other material on, so you would suddenly be confronted with, in Guy's case in particular, classical music before it then returned to the conversation in hand. And from those wonderful transcriptions you did, it's clear that all involved seemed constantly bombarded and overwhelmed by classic poltergeist phenomena, including things flying across the rooms and levitating and items and dishes breaking, furniture moving, things like that. And maybe that's just what it seems like from the reader's point of view after reading over a year's worth of crazy activity, but it impresses me that we have <laughs> any kind of organized documentation of this case at all with all of that uh, going on. I imagine it must have been frustrating to try to make sense of it all and keep up with it all. I don't know how Guy and Morris kept their senses. Yes, um, they, they were fairly strained at various times, in particular Morris, I think. One also has to remember that on the tapes, there were, there were large chunks of silence when the girls in particular were asleep um, and the tape was left on, but one had to listen to the tape just in case they woke up in the middle of the night and, and started doing something. There was also times when the television was on full blast, everybody was talking at once, and you tried to work out exactly who was saying what and whether it was on the television or not. And lots of it were incredibly boring, like when they were talking about the good old English weather or what was happening down the road with Mrs. X, Y, or Z. So it was it was far from being 100% all poltergeist activity. And I bet it was a nice little uh, history lesson for you at times. I mean, that's a, that's a nice chunk of history that has gone by since <laughs> anyone listened to those tapes. Yes, indeed. And um, being in the 1970s, I was most certainly around in the 1970s. So there were things being talked about when I was thinking, crumbs, I can remember that as well. <laughs> <laughs> the voices in the poltergeist activity isn't what necessarily scared me so much in this case, as much as some of the things that were reported to have been seen on several occasions. And the one that stands out to me is I forget who it was, but someone reported seeing one of the girls, I think Janet, at the top of the stairs when she was clearly accounted for downstairs. Or there's examples of seeing a hand or the shadow of a man, for example. And so I'm assuming that most of those experiences um, you were basically dictating as you heard people report them on tapes. Yes, absolutely right. There were no times where somebody suddenly screamed and said, look, there's an apparition there, but they did report having seen things. And quite graphically at times, they explained exactly what they'd witnessed and seen. And not just the, the direct family, but also other people that were visiting the house as well. So it was a, a fairly large number of people that also witnessed what they believed they either apparitions or, as you said, a hand appearing. What were some of the more shocking or exceptional things, whether it be voices or, or things that you could hear were going on while you were listening to these tapes? Okay, well, this breaks down for me into two categories. One was actually hearing the movement of things as they flew across the room and crashed onto the floor, which you can clearly hear on the tapes now and then. Now, of course, one doesn't see them so you don't see the box rising up and shooting across the room and hitting Morris Gross for instance um, but you hear the reactions of everybody concerned and it doesn't sound that one in particular as 
as if it was some sort of joke that was being done at his expense. And then the other category that was shocking, and I, I won't be able to go into too much detail here, but it was the language that was used on the tapes uh, by the so-called voices were extremely sexually explicit and extremely obscene at times as well. So every swear word you can imagine was being used by these two girls. Man, I can't imagine that. Several of the additional reports from guests and experts who had visited over that time period were critical. And first of all, I should back up and say it was nice to see a balance of, and not that you chose the balance, but that's kind of the the reports that you researched and from the the main report, I guess, from the SPR of people that visited and uh, witnessed some of the phenomena and their take on things. But some of these reports after the fact were critical of the fact that it had become a circus with so many interesting visitors, experiments going on, and they believed that the family saw it as entertainment. And that's something I think that probably a lot of people, if they read any books about the topic, have going through their head that, man, that was a lot of stuff, people going in and out and visitors and trying to go about your life and a a single mom having uh, several kids just trying to survive. But they even apparently, and I didn't realize this, had a guest book in the house for people to sign. What's your take on that? Yes, I was um, a little bit suspicious about that. It was a visitor's book. Um, There's nothing about that on the tapes at all. So one doesn't hear uh, Mrs. Hodgson saying, and now would you like to sign the visitor's book, for instance? Um, But I've certainly come across that in the reports from different people. And that inevitably made them a little bit suspicious about whether this was just sort of some fun and games going on. And, And by the way, at times, I think it probably was. The whole essence of this particular case is the difficulty of saying it was just one thing. Of course, the girls cheated at times, but I would say there was also some genuine activity going on there. There wasn't just them fooling about or being misrepresented or or just false identity, false interpretation. I think there was genuine stuff going on as well as some of the other things. And I forget uh, toward the end of the book, one of the reports of someone who spent a bit of time mentioned that Janet seemed to have some other a lot of other things going on. And um, there were different thoughts about whether um, Gross at one time pointed out that he thought Janet was suffering from a hidden or split personality syndrome. And, you know, Mrs. Hodgson was struggling, I think, to uh, keep her family going for quite a while. And I don't think they had much of a life outside of the house, but someone mentioned that the voices when they were trying to communicate with the voices, Janet or, or the voice would say that they would, they would do certain tricks, I guess, for those present. If they could go to the park uh, was one example. And he talked about how uh, kind of sad that was to hear that. And, and they did indeed, you know, find a way to take a quick trip to the park. So it sounds to me like people were also very, willing to accommodate some entertainment for this family. Yes, I, I think that's right. They, they had a difficult life. Um, the, the mother struggled very hard to, to keep control of the four children. One of them, in fact, was at a special school a lot of the time um, because he had emotional difficulties. Uh, and he subsequently died, by the way, when he was still quite young. I think he was about 16 or 17 when he died. And the rest of the family, uh, Billy, the youngest boy, had a very bad speech impediment Uh, which meant it was quite difficult understanding what he was saying. Janet was undoubtedly highly strung. And Margaret, I think, was was just trying to sort of cope with everything that was going on around her, like the mother. I said that Gross, you know, had mentioned a few times that he thought it could be a hidden or split personality syndrome with Janet. But Mrs. Hodgson, uh, Janet's mom, mentioned that she thought, and, and you'd, pointed this out several times. I guess it's however many times it was discussed, but she thought that Janet was doing things, um, but not necessarily realizing that she was doing them 
like being possessed by a spirit. And I don't think that Morris or Guy uh, tended to to like that theory. No, no, they they didn't. They they didn't really go for the spirit possession side of things. They they looked at works about spirit possession, but they didn't really want to bring in that aspect to it because. Otherwise, you get into demons and what have you, and the Exorcist film comes to light, and I think that was the last thing they wanted to do. As far as Janet's uh, psychological problems, I think that it was Guy that suggested it could have been some aspect of Tourette's syndrome, which is is not quite a split personality, but nevertheless, it, it does cause obvious psychological problems. Yeah, Tourette's is brought up, I've, or I've seen it be brought up several times in different cases like this. Until now, I had no idea that at the time, and maybe even still now, you'll have to to tell us, but this case was very controversial, and the consensus of the members of the SPR was split as to whether it was genuinely paranormal. And as you know, you yourself as a member of the SP, SPR, it also makes me wonder kind of how the workings of the SPR, uh, how it works. And you uh, read in this report about how the the case was handed off to Morris and then how Guy was brought in. And you get a little taste in some of the follow-up reports of how uh, the workings of the SPR was. Is it the same now? And, you know, tell us about some of the uh, the split you know, sides that people would take in this controversial case? Well, the SPR does not have a corporate opinion. So every member of the SPR voices their own opinion. So one has to make that very clear. Nobody speaks specifically for the SPR. Having said that, as you just indicated, opinions on this case and on many other cases, by the way, past and present and probably future, uh, everybody has different opinions. So people will believe uh, one thing about something that somebody else will disbelieve and vice versa. This certainly happened with Enfield. But the problem with Enfield was that people would come along for an hour or two and then they would make an opinion. Whereas Guy and Morris were there, as you know, for hundreds of hours, overnight stays galore. Um, They were in a much better position to judge what was going on there than somebody that swanned along for an evening uh, nothing happened. So they went away and said, nah, nothing's happening. <laughs> yeah. And I'm telling you, it was just because I was having a time crunch before this interview, I, I almost, uh, or I considered skipping the section at the end that had the reports. You reached out to different people who were involved, who were still living and gave them the opportunity to give you kind of their take um, with so many years past. Now, and that was such an interesting section to read, not only to see how their thoughts had changed, but, you know, just to see such a wide variety of different takes on what was going on. And even some of them were like, well, my statement at the time, uh, one of them said, you you know, it was really, uh, you know, forward of me to uh, give this opinion when I was so inexperienced at the time, you know, and... (laughs) So they they really looked back at their thoughts and 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 what was going on. It was cool. Yes, I I must say I rather liked that section myself. Uh, giving people a chance to say either yes, no, I I I completely agree with what I said, of course, or to say well, woo, uh, things have changed now, and I view things a bit more maturely. And some of the people that expressed their opinions were big enough to be able to say that that perhaps they weren't quite on the ball then compared to now. So many of us were gritting our teeth and rolling our eyes after watching the Conjuring 2 film, which Uh. of course made the Warrens the heroes of the story and possibly stole many elements of Morris and Guy's research. And for myself, it was, it was hard to watch the success of any movie like that. Where when I knew so much about the case and I'm sitting there struggling to watch it. And one thing that my audience likes to debate is how big of a role the Warrens played in the case, if at all. And when I interviewed Guy Lyon Playfair, he wasn't 
clear on if the Warrens had made more than one visit or if it was just one visit, but his statements match up with what you noted from the tapes. And it was so juicy to read this. And it it was, it felt so, it gave me such a warm fuzzy to see, you know, (laughs) that it matched up. But we learned that the Warrens arrived on June 16th, 1978, which was roughly nine months after Guy and Morris first was on the case. But on that day, they conducted a few brief interviews And one of those was for a live TV program. And you said it was kind of odd that that was going on at the same time. And then that's all we hear about the Warrens until a later, a little bit later. And I'd like to read what you transcribed from a tape a little more than a year later after that first visit. And I wish you could have seen my eyes light up when I read this. So you estimated that this might be from August 14th. In 1979. Correct. So John Burkham related that, and this is directly from your book. John Burkham related that the Warrens had arrived out of the blue early in the morning and taken loads of photos and that the children had become very excited since the girls were going to be taken out for a meal at a wimpy bar, but not the boys. Mrs. Burkham was very unhappy about it and Mrs. Hodgson was also annoyed at the Warrens' constant interviewing. They talked about making money, and it was said they are trying to capitalize on the case. According to Mrs. Hodgson, the Warrens appeared to be against Gross and Playfair, and they were encouraging it, meaning the phenomena. Janet threw some tantrums, and Mrs. Burkham said half the voices were fake. There was writing on the wall, quantities of water from unknown sources, bangings and knockings on the wall, and a heap of dead flies on the mat, which Billy might have perpetrated. John Burkham narrated that an ashtray disappeared and appeared when no one else was there and that there was a lot of activity after the Americans came. And I was just like, oh, that is juicy drama right there. And it made me so happy to know that so many people were annoyed by the Warrens. Maybe that makes me a horrible person. Well, I never met the Warrens, so I I can't prejudge them. I always had a slight worry about people that described themselves as demonologists. That seemed a little bit um, over the top, shall we say, but perhaps I'm wrong and perhaps they were genuinely discovering demons and things that they could then lay to rest or, or send away. As far as the conjuring too was concerned, well, words fail me. But a, a great horror film, uh, like Hammer Horror movies used to be, but with very little, to be honest, to do with the genuine Enfield case. And that that's painfully obvious to I think anyone who. Uh, has knowledge of the case before walking in to see that film. And you're right. It was, it was a great film, but I I've mentioned man, many times the credits. I don't know why, but they they, the credits took a lot of the images, well-known images and things from the case from, from Morris and guy and kind of placed the Warrens into those. So to me, that was just, Oh, that was heartbreaking and so frustrating to see that. And of course, people who are just there for entertainment that don't know anything about the case, now their minds are formed that, you know, the Warrens are going around being the heroes of all these uh, famous cases. I couldn't possibly comment. (laughs) (laughs) Some other interesting details that I noted from the book is that Some of the furniture and curtains in the home had come from a house where a small child had been murdered. Were you shocked to, (laughs) and were you like, duh, when you heard that? Um, I I thought, well, first of all, if it's true, um, then I thought, well, that's um, slightly unpleasant. It could play on people's minds. Um, But on the other hand, I'm not sure that my own particular psyche would would worry too much about that because uh. um, I don't believe that 
you know, that that would happen in, in a, a, I don't believe that the spirits would jump out of the table that belonged to somebody who allegedly murdered somebody. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> it was also cool to get in additional information about the witness Hazel Short. And I will always remember hearing about the lollipop lady. And, you know, as, as an American, I'm sitting here going, what is a lollipop lady? And, you know, you learn that that's kind of a crossing guard. And it was cool to hear another additional report that I don't think anybody had really seen of what she saw. Uh, she saw Janet levitating outside of the home um, and and really claimed that there uh, I think her um, report and, and what she said she saw, you know, people really uh, used that to convince people of its paranormality, maybe. Yes. I, I have to correct one little thing you said. Um, Hazel Short didn't see Janet levitate, levitating outside of the home. Hazel Short was outside of the home. Right. And right. Janet was in her bedroom. <laughs> um, just a, a lollipop lady, of course, is, is politically incorrect now in this ridiculous world we live in. So we're, we're not allowed to say that. It has to be gro- crossing guard person, I believe. <laughs> but at the time, they were, they were lollipop ladies for two reasons. One is because they were usually ladies. And the other reason was that the big sign they held resembled a lollipop. Her testimony was very interesting indeed. It was also witnessed by a friend of hers who wanted nothing to do with it at the time or since. So it was verified by somebody else that was with her at the time. Um, and she described Janet's levitation in quite some detail. If if it was levitation, one should act. Uh, sorry, one should add. Um, and she also said that Janet's body was like a lazy Z shape, um, which is again a bit different from the pure levitation one has has seen in films like the Ghostbusters and in in the Exorcist, where the body is completely horizontal and hovering in midair. It wasn't like that. We also know that, and of course the movie, I remember talking to Guy about this, not the the new movie, but there was the the made for TV movie, I think, where Janet uh, had gone to the hospital and had, uh, what do they call it? They had wired her up to. Yeah, it was an EEG, I think. Yeah, yeah. I was like, would they have done something like that? And Guy was like shocked at that. He was like, no, that never would have happened. But we know that Janet spent six weeks in a hospital and there was reported activity happening at the house during that time span. But then later on, I read something that said that there was nothing happening at the house during that time span. But the hospital apparently found Janet to be quite normal that you wrote. Yes. Well, there was a little bit of activity at the house when Janet wasn't there, but not very much at all. And that could have been uh, exaggerated. It could have been that they were expecting something to happen. Um, and so it happened without Janet being there. As, at the hospital, she was classed as being completely normal. But during one set of tests, um, which I think was at the Birkbeck Institute, I'm not sure. So I may have, I may have got that wrong off the top of my head. Um, when they were doing some weighing of her, they found uh, that she actually had put on some weight during the course of an experiment, rather than the sort of levitating away from the machine. And that they found was quite unusual, um, because it was the opposite to what they were expecting to happen. So that, it's an example that Guy used to often quote, but I should stress none of that is on the tapes. So strictly speaking, I shouldn't be commenting about it. <laughs> That is so interesting. Interesting that they would make note of that at the hospital. It's very parapsychology of them to do that kind of thing. Were these just like medical professionals or were, were there any other paranormal exper- experiments done at the time in the hospital? Uh, in the hospital, there weren't paranormal experiments done. Uh, at the home, Guy and Morris and a few others tried some metal bending experiments with them but they were not successful. Um, I've got actually in, in my possession some of the artifacts from the Enfield Poltergeist case. I have a box full of the things that were thrown around there. 
and including some metal that was bent. And it's, it's bent quite substantially, but evidently it was, it was done when there was nobody watching, um, which, which always means that there was a possibility that it was being bent uh, by force of hand. In a follow-up report, Gross made the statement, I can safely say that at least 95% of the events that have taken place while I have been president, president, while I have been present, have been genuine. And I thought that was really, I don't know, I guess I thought that was hard to believe, but people had made these statements in some of their follow-up reports, uh, some of the witnesses, that they thought maybe Gross and Morris were, I don't know, somebody was was saying that they were possibly a little gullible and that they were too quick to say that things were paranormal. Well, I would certainly not give percentages to things, uh, which is why I always re- refuse to say that I gave it 110% when I was playing football. Uh, <laughs> so percentages are not good for me. However, I would dispute that the 95% that Morris said uh, were all genuine uh, occasions. I have listened to the tapes where he has said on the tape that he believed that this was 100% genuine. And I was thinking, well, I'm not very happy about what I'm hearing on the tape at this moment. I would be really sad if I had you in the parlor here. And as a music nerd and a music educator, I would be dumb if I did not ask you about music and the paranormal. You have a book, Music, Witchcraft, and the Paranormal. And I didn't let you know about this, so I'm kind of springing this on you. But what can you tell us about your work with music and the paranormal? That's fascinating. Uh, Have you got 10 hours available on your show? (laughs) (laughs) We'll do 10 follow-up episodes. (laughs) Okay. Well, my training in the earlier part of my life was into music, and uh, I thought increasingly there's some very weird things going on in music, which I can't explain in just pure musical logical terms. So one of the things, for instance, was all these strange people that seemed to be able to communicate with dead composers. We had one in England, very famously, called Rosemary Brown, who was producing pretty good classical music from a whole range of dead composers even though she was a school dinner lady and didn't really have much musical training. So I thought somebody ought to be having a look at this. So I I started looking at her and then found there were lots and lots of other people scattered around the country. I limited it to Britain because of obvious expense and and what have you. Um, I investigated these people and found that there was a big range of of capability there, that, that some of them I thought were absolute rubbish. Who are you trying to kid? And other people, I thought, had some real genuine phenomena going on there, and which I needed to investigate as fully as I could. Now, this was just one aspect, music and mediums. Another aspect of it, and I'll go through this quickly, obviously, was that musical ghosts. Now, I, I love musical ghosts. So a ghost walks through the wall, I'm not interested. But if they're playing the violin, then I'll be listening. Um, so I, I looked at the examples throughout the history of uh, apparitions or ghostly sightings, I was going to say, I should have said soundings, where music was heard in an inexplicable situation. So that was another chunk of my first PhD. And then finally, the third chunk of it was doing um, using music for what's known as a Gansfeld experiment, which is telepathy, basically. So somebody listens to a piece of music. And in a different building, somebody is trying to pick up what that person is listening to in a different building. Um, And then that can be scored accordingly to to whether they got it right or whether they didn't get it right. That is fascinating. And I can tell you that in my brief time as a paranormal investigator, I had a team, which was my family. And um, I thought I was fairly serious about it at the time. And we were certainly not parapsychologists or the SPR. But one thing that I liked doing is doing some research on a case before going in, especially if it was, you know, had some history behind it. 
and using what we would pop culture now would, you know, say trigger objects, you know, to try to inspire some paranormal activity to happen. And I liked to use music. And so I used it a lot at an old farmhouse that we investigated from uh, 1901. And so I had a lot of fun putting together a playlist, um, you know, over the decades from 1901 to like up to, you know, the last time that people had been in the the farmhouse to try to, uh, you know, communicate that way and try to inspire some things going on. And uh, I'm wondering if you, we didn't, have anything happen, you know, from that, by the way, it was very boring, but, uh, I had a lot of fun doing it. And I'm wondering if you've looked into music in that way at all. I think that's a really interesting thing that you did. So I I wish I'd have thought of that myself. (laughs) Having said that, what I did investigate was were places where music was meant to be heard when there was no sound source available. So I went along with my tape recorder or video camera or both to see if I could record any anomalous music. Now, unfortunately, I was only successful once, and that ended up being a cleaning lady who was playing a tape of plain song in the church when she was cleaning it. (laughs) Uh, Were you disappointed? (laughs) Hugely, hugely. (laughs) Uh, sir, it has been such an honor to talk to you. And again, um, I want to let people, let listeners know that they definitely need to check out this book, especially if they were around a couple of years ago for our other episodes and, and found it fascinating. But the book is The Enfield Poltergeist Tapes, one of the most disturbing cases in history. What really happened? And uh, it's it's just really great. And I, I want to thank you for putting the hours and the energy into transcribing it because I think, like I said, I think the world deserved to see what you heard in the tapes. Do you know uh, if any if there's any plan for any of the um, the audio from any more of these tapes to be released publicly, the audio? This is in the hands of the Council of the Society for Psychical Research because they hold the copyright. And I think that they will eventually, this is just my opinion, that they will eventually go along with that and make them certainly available to be listened to by members of the SPR and possibly even at a later date for anybody that's willing to listen to them. Awesome. I hope I'm around when that happens. So do you have any final thoughts? And then, uh, you know, let us know where else we can find the book and if there's anything i don't know if there's a a site you'd like to promote where people can find you how people can contact you if you're into that kind of thing and uh you know if there's anything you feel like you wished you could have talked about today well i i think that uh, between us we've covered it really quite well so i'm i'm very happy about what we've chatted about and the way in which we've chatted about it i as it says on the back of the book do not buy this book if you want a biased account one way or the other. But if you want to know what was certainly heard on those tapes, then you should be buying the book. There's a small part in the book that, that welcomes people's feedback. And if anybody wants to get hold of me, then they can always get hold of me via White Crow, uh, which is the publisher of the book. If they email or, or send letters or whatever, then I'm sure White Pro Books um, in, in the UK will pass those details on to me and then I can contact people directly. You rock. Thank you, sir.